Hello and welcome to our skills training program. We will be applying the principles of motor control and learning to teach a novice how to perform a tennis serve in a four week training program. After four weeks of training we expect the novice to reach a level of performance where they can serve the ball over the net with a high success rate and both a fluid and coordinated movement. We expect that the novice will go from the cognitive stage of learning through to the associative stage of learning by the end of this training program. The tennis serve can be classified one-dimensionally as a gross motor skill, as the movement requires large musculature to perform. The tennis serve is also classed as a discrete skill. This is because the serve has a distinct start and end point. The tennis serve is a closed skill as the performer decides when they are going to initiate the action and the environment does not change between trials. When classifying the tennis serve two-dimensionally, we have to take into account the function of the action, in which the body remains stable and objects are manipulated, and the environmental context, which basically regulates how the skill can be performed. The game of tennis has regulatory conditions which remain stationary, such as the height of the net and the dimensions of the court. However, the serve has regulatory conditions which are in motion, and they are the tennis racket and ball. If any of these conditions were to change, then the difficulty of the skill would change accordingly. As the server is required to hit the ball into different service boxes, we consider the tennis serve to have inter-trial variability. We would rate the tennis serve as a 14 on Gentile's two-dimensional taxonomy. Based on our research, the tennis serve has eight key aspects that are broken into three distinct phases. First up is the preparation phase. This consists of body preparation, release of the ball, loading back onto the legs and cocking the arm into position. Secondly, the acceleration phase, which consists of accelerating the racket towards the ball and contact of the racket with the ball. Lastly is the follow-through phase, which consists of decelerating the body after the swing and the follow-through of the swing motion in preparation of a return hit. We will assess our performer using both quantitative and qualitative measurements. After several demonstrations of a tennis serve, we will have our novice perform 10 trials. Each trial will have the key aspects rated qualitatively on a Leichhardt scale, and we will also count the number of times the ball passes over the net and lands into the correct service box. This test will be performed pre-training, post-training, and after a four-week break of training to measure retention of learning. There are three types of transfer of learning which can be applied to our training program. Positive transfer, which is if our novice has had any experience playing a sport that is similar to tennis, such as squash, whereby an alteration of the skill is needed but the basic understanding is already there. Negative transfer, which is where another sport may confuse the novice when trying to learn basic tennis skills, such as cricket, due to the difference in grip and swing of a bat. And zero transfer, which is where there is no transfer of learning at all due to it being a completely different sport, such as AFL. From the week plans, there will be a demonstration of the whole skill at the beginning of the training program to allow the novice to perceive the invariant movement patterns of a tennis skill. This will also allow the novice to perceive information about the strategy used by the demonstrator to solve movement problems, such as not having your feet at the correct degree of the baseline. This is more relevant to the cognitive mediation theory, Bandura, as the observation being observed will translate into a symbolic memory code that forms the basis of a stored representation in memory. This theory is more relevant as the dynamic view of modelling based on J.J. Gibson, as he explains that the observed movement acts in a way that constrains the motor control system to act accordingly so that the person does not need to engage in cognitive mediation. Furthermore, the novice will be required to think about their movements and decisions whilst completing the serve, utilising their memory from previous examples. That's why we cannot apply Gibson's theory. Verbal cues will also be used during the demonstration to allow the novice to be given the opportunity to observe a competent demonstration while the demonstrator draws attention to key elements of the movement. Throughout practice, the demonstrator will use verbal cues to prompt the emphasised movement pattern elements. Both knowledge of results and knowledge of performance will be delivered to the novice during the four-week training program. Wolf and Shea summarise knowledge of results as the results produced in regards to the environmental goals. They summarise knowledge of performance as the nature of the movement produced. Knowledge of results is seen by Wolf and Shea as an integral part of learning. They found that the absence of knowledge of results resulted in the absence of learning. Practice without knowledge of results causes performance to drift away from the goal and weaken the representation of the action in memory. In the beginning of the training program, large amounts of feedback will be given and as time progresses, the amount of feedback will decrease substantially. This is supported by the findings of Schmidt, 
who agrees that less frequent feedback instead of feedback given at every trial is more beneficial in learning. In the first week of our skills training program, we have decided to have a one hour introductory session where we will perform the pretest and introduce the novice to the skill of the tennis serve. Our skills training program will be in a distributed practice format where there will be multiple shorter sessions. The following training sessions and weeks to come will include three 45 minute sessions where we will progressively expose the novice to more elements of the tennis serve. As the week progresses, the complexity of the elements will also increase. For weeks two to four, the first two sessions of the week will be face-to-face -face sessions where the novice will learn new skills. The third session will can be completed in the novice's own time where they will be performing general exercises to better their tennis ability and complete reps and sets of skills learned to solidify their learning from previous sessions. The general exercises will cover the aspects that Tennis Australia believe are important in training. These include agility, speed, core strength and power. The goal of the first session with the novice is to introduce them to the tennis serve. After the novice performs a pre-training test, the trainer will provide several silent demonstrations before giving general instructions such as where to stand, where to hit the ball and how to hold the racket. The second session is to introduce various drills the novice will perform each session. These are intended to improve hand-eye coordination as well as racket and ball coordination. The third session for each week will have the novice practice these drills in addition to the general exercises we've already introduced. The goal of week two is to improve on the swinging motion of the racket and accuracy of hitting the ball. The first session involves placing various targets on the court and having the novice try to hit them with the ball. The second session introduces a drill where they hold the racket and perform a throwing action. This is to help them feel comfortable performing this movement as it is very similar to what is required when serving. The third session for this week will have the novice perform the previously learnt drills and general exercises. The goal of week 3 is to position the body and feet correctly during the cocking and acceleration stages. Session 1 will warm up with all of the previously learnt drills and then focus on foot position and the transfer of weight during the serve. Session 2 focuses on upper body positioning such as the rotation of the torso, arm positioning and how the novice should metaphorically use the racket to scratch their back in order to hold it in the correct position. The third session for this week will once again have the novice perform general exercises and the previously learnt drills in their own time. The goal of week 4 is to add all the elements together to successfully complete the serve. Session 1 will have the novice perform several complete serves. A game-like situation will then be applied to the novice where they are in a tie break and are required to make the serve to win. The second session will have the novice perform the previously learnt drills and exercises in their own time before the final session where they will perform a post-training test. We have elected to break up the tennis serve into separate sections in order to focus in detail on the key aspects. As the tennis serve is considered high in complexity and low in organisation, which makes part practice the optimal approach when teaching the skill. We will use a segmentation approach to reduce the difficulty of the skill for the novice and focus on different parts of the serve. We will also use a fractionalised approach which focuses on different limbs separately before putting the action together. In the beginning of the training program, the drills and activities will be taught using the blocked practice method. This is due to our student being a novice and it is more beneficial for them to learn the basic skills properly through repetition before adding complexity. We will then change to random practice method. Despite the random practice causing poorer performance during skill acquisition, performance is superior to blocked practice during the retention test. 